This video is brought to you by Sporlin. Quality, integrity, and tradition. This morning we have a service call on a freezer not working. They're saying the bottom temp is, well they're saying the bottom of the box, the temp is high and the top is fine, which is an odd request, but this should be a warranty call too, so we're gonna dive into this guy and see what we can figure out. All right, so we open up the compressor section, the condenser's clean. It was pretty cold when I got here. Evaporator's not iced up. There's a tiny bit of ice on the expansion valve, nothing to be really concerned about, so. So the unit was down to temp when I got here. It was semi-loaded with food. The condenser's a little bit dirty, but not bad. It's just sticky. Um, this guy's running. Both evaporator fan motors are running. Um, at this point, we're, because they're complaining that, you know, like during the day, the temps go up. So we're gonna go ahead and run a leak check on this guy. I'm going over this thing and for the life of me, I am not finding a leak. I even pulled back the insulation. Now, the insulation itself sets off the leak detector. But, I'm not, sometimes on the older leak detectors that would happen. And I think that's the case on this one because I pulled back the insulation and moved it. But I'm gonna go ahead and remove the insulation on the rest of that line and then thoroughly leak check just the line. But I went through the evaporator. This is the uh, Inficon gas mate and it is a little bit sensitive. You gotta be careful with it. Cause like for instance, if I tap it, it goes berserk. Like it's, it's kind of cruddy in that aspect so you gotta watch out for that stuff and understand how the leak detector works to this day there's not a amazing leak detector for hydrocarbon refrigerants yet so but let's take this back in here but if you if you just set it down in here and don't hit anything it doesn't go off but if you literally put it in the same spot and tap it it'll go off there it goes so that's just the sensitivity on the leak detector. And we have it on the highest sensitivity too. So you can drop it down if you wanted to, but I like that. So um, yeah, I'm just going through it. And the next step that I'm gonna do, I'm gonna pull off that insulation. Um, we don't know that there's a leak. We're just, before we put service ports or anything, but before we put service ports, I would actually do temperature clamps. This is one of those dilemmas. I have gone through this guy multiple times it's at negative one right now it's a little off on that but not bad but my probe I, I don't expect i'm not worried about that but everything looks fine i've watched it turn on and turn off and satisfy uh turns on at negative two turns off about negative eight ish um temperatures don't look bad i'm i'm very reluctant to put service gauges on this guy because i would have to add access ports when i can't find anything wrong i mean the condenser is I mean, there's, there's a little bit of film, but nothing to even make it do anything. Everything seems fine on this guy. I, I don't know what else to tell him. The defrost works, everything. So, yeah. Um, unfortunately, too, this won't be a warranty thing because I can't find anything wrong. You know, they're complaining the bottom's not working, so verify the doors spring close, and they do. They're not getting stuck open. Best place to check a door spring is barely open, and if it shuts itself. Just barely, right? It just barely shuts itself and then slam one door, slam another, make sure they don't stay open. I am not seeing a single thing wrong with this unit. It's kicking butt. The last thing I need to check is just, I'm pretty confident the sensors are fine, but I just need to check the sensors in here. Other than that, there's nothing else I can tell them. So what we're looking for here is uh, ATT is our uh, box temp. And then, um, ET1 is our evaporator temp, negative 25. So the evap temp, I mean, that seems a little bit low, but I think it's okay. And really, if that was high, that'd be our concern because then it would skip a defrost. Um, but yeah, everything is fine. One thing I just thought about that I will discuss with them is how they load the box because this box the discharge air does not have a channel going down to the back of the box so if they load this all up that air is going to have a hard time so they need to keep it a couple inches from the back that way we can go all the way down to the bottom and get even airflow 
and then suck in through the return. So some boxes actually have like a duct running down, but this one doesn't. So if they were to shove all the food and fill this up with, which they did when I got here, I believe they had all fries in here, um, that would stop or impede the airflow down to the bottom of the box. Other than that, I can't find anything wrong. So this isn't gonna be a warranty thing. So when you're doing warranty calls, um, they're actually very frustrating for business owners, okay? As a business owner, I personally, as of right now, don't do any warranty work for manufacturers. I work on the behalf of my customers, okay? So I, it's very limited the amount of warranty work I'm actually allowed to do because I am not technically an authorized service agency. Um, now, some of my customers have negotiated and gotten the manufacturers to approve me as an authorized warranty vendor just for that specific customer. In that situation, it puts me in a better place because imagine uh, if you guys don't understand as a business owner having to go into a customer that you've never been to and tell them that, you know what, after I spent two hours on this job, the manufacturer is actually not going to pay for this repair and you have to pay the bill. See, customers don't understand that even though they're like, well, you know, on site, they just don't get it. And that's one of the reasons why I prefer not to do warranty work on behalf of the manufacturers. Again. I am working for my customer, but I do have to agree to the terms at which the manufacturer is willing to pay me. So that is kind of a, an issue with warranty work because typically manufacturers don't pay standard labor rates. They typically have negotiated labor rates. Um, and so I basically have to conform to the authorized service companies in my area, their negotiated labor rates that they have negotiated with the manufacturers. It's just one of the games you have to play. But in this situation, I got a service call of one of my from one of my own customers and I had to go through their location and I had to you know basically tell them hey this is not going to be paid for by the warranty because there's nothing wrong with this box and in conclusion it actually ended up being the way that they were storing product in the box okay or at least that's the best bet that I could come up to at the time mind you this video is from a couple months ago and we haven't had any more issues since I educated the customer on how to properly load the box up okay but initially when we go through the call we treat it like anything else we're investigating right I'm looking at everything I'm going through all the comments and steps. Um, the complaint of, hey, it works in the morning but not in the afternoon kind of made me think, hey, you know, it could be a refrigerant related issue. Uh, who knows? You know, as it warms up throughout the day, it's not keeping up. So that's why I did a leak search on the box. But I did not see the need to put service gauges on it because it's a critically charged R290 system. I didn't want to go that route. So I did a quick leak search on all the hot spots, did some temperature checks with my temperature clamps, and nothing jumped out to say, hey, there's a problem. Now, had I walked up on the box and it was at 50 degrees and it wasn't coming down to temperature fast enough, of course, I would have dove into it. But in this situation, the box was actually down to temperature when I arrived. I took all the product out, brought the box temperature up quite a bit put it back together and watched it come down within a you know half hour, 45 minute time frame, back down to where it was supposed to be and watched it cycle several times on and off. So that to me indicated that there wasn't really a refrigerant related issue. Now, also using basic common sense, I shouldn't say common sense, using basic troubleshooting logic based off of the amount of times I've worked on these boxes, I looked for ice patterns on the evaporator coil. Now, if we saw a partially iced up evaporator coil just where the metering device entered the coil and then the metering device was all iced up, it might indicate a refrigerant related issue, but that wasn't the case. I mean, there was a tiny bit of ice on the expansion valve, but nothing to be too concerned about. I watched the unit go through a defrost cycle of which I didn't explain in the video, but I did watch it go through a defrost cycle um, check the temperature sensors. Everything seemed to be okay. So this one was kind of a textbook issue. And then when I was all finished at the end, um, you know, I had them uh, load the box up and I'll show you a clip of that right now. And you guys can see that, you know, they had the product stored improperly. Now this wasn't even fully loaded up. They had it just, they were just starting to load it. And I was actually going to use the restroom. And when I came back, they had it halfway loaded. And I was like, wait, 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 let me clip this, you know? So I got a video of it showing. So they were about to load up the top with even more stuff, okay? And if you think about their original complaint, it was working on the top, but it wasn't working on the bottom. Well, that makes sense because if they were filling that with fries in those pans up there, mainly it was the fries on the second shelf, fully loaded front to back, well, then that would happen because it couldn't get any airflow down to the bottom. So it makes sense as to what the potential problem was. So that's how I go through this process. But again, 
I don't just jump to that conclusion. I still went through and did temperature checks, you know, evaluated the system. The temperatures seemed okay. Uh, I will tell you that I mentioned in the video, or I didn't mention in the video, originally when these R290 units first came out, Delfield, the manufacturer of this box, was doing a really good job of logging what their temperatures should be on the lines. Well, they since have stopped doing that because I actually called Delfield to say, hey, what should the temperatures be? you know, on all the different refrigerant lines before I apply service gauges. And they said they no longer give those numbers out because maybe the boxes have changed or something. So um, in the past, you used to do a lot of temperature checks, but now it's more or less just rules of thumb. I'm just looking for a massive difference between discharge and liquid. I'm looking for a nice cold suction. You know, you can kind of make some estimations. Uh, it's not 100% accurate. One way that you can estimate if you ever want to know because every manufacturer designs their box to be different and operate different, right? And if you ever want to know what a manufacturer designs their evaporator TD to be, right? The difference between the return and the saturated temperature of the refrigerant in the middle of the evaporator um, is call the manufacturer and ask them what pressures they want at what temperatures, okay? Because manufacturers oftentimes won't tell you superheat, subcooling, anything like that. But what they will tell you is we want this suction pressure, this head pressure at this box temperature and this ambient. Well, with that being said, you can backwards calculate what kind of TDs they designed their system to equ uh, to operate with. Because if you know that they want, uh, let's just say, I'm just throwing numbers out there, that they wanted on a 404A box 225 head pressure at an 80 degree um, outdoor ambient, well, then you could do the calculations, find the saturated temperature, find the outside air temperature, and you can calculate what their condenser TD is. And the same thing goes for the evaporator too. So you can backwards calculate some numbers. And if you know what the TDs are supposed to be, you can get some approximate line temperatures, you know, kind of within a ballpark figure to kind of tell you, you know, if the line temperatures are somewhat close. Those are just some little tricks that you can do to try to calculate how manufacturers design their boxes. But you also have to understand every manufacturer beats to the tune of their own drum. You can have a 134A box with a capillary tube for one manufacturer and for another manufacturer, and they will both recommend different operating pressures because they design different efficiencies on the evaporator, different TDs on the evaporator, different things like that. So like I said, you always want to lean on each individual manufacturer to find out where they want their system to be operating at. Okay. So Basic troubleshooting skills, nothing too crazy. I did everything I could. The box has been working since I educated the customer on how to properly store the food. I really appreciate you guys making it to the end of the video. It's been awesome. Um, do me a favor. If you haven't already, check out my website, HVACRvideos at G I'm sorry, HVACRvideos.com. I was giving my email address out for a sec, but um, we have merchandise available on there. It's a great way to support the channel if uh, you're interested in doing so. Uh, you can also support the channel via PayPal, YouTube channel memberships, Patreon, um, truetechtools.com. I have an offer code, big picture, one word, you'll get an 8% discount. There's links to all of these things in the show notes of this video. Um, you know, it's just a, a cool way to help support the channel if you're interested in doing so. So thank you guys very much, and uh, we will catch you on the next one.